This lecture is intended as a supplement to the series of lectures on temporal bone pathology. If you already have a really strong understanding of temporal bone anatomy, you can skip right into those lectures and skip this one. When we perform CT of the temporal bone, it's important to do it with high resolution imaging uh, using a multi-detector CT scanner. You want a minimum of 16 channels on your CT. 64 is really optimal. Remember that it's important to overlap your slices. That is, if you are doing 0.6 millimeter slices, for example, you want the interslice distance to be only 0.3 millimeters, half the thickness, so that there is a lot of overlap between the slices. This will make much more attractive reformatted images. We reformat into coronal and sagittal planes. A lot of people advocate for additional reformats at 45 degrees in the planes of Stenver and Poshel, but it's been conclusively shown that those don't improve diagnostic accuracy. For MRI, uh, there are basic images of the brain that are included in the protocol, sagittal T1 axial flare, axial post contrast, and we usually add a few others. And then uh, the IAC specific images include pre and post contrast T1. You definitely want some coronal post contrast. And perhaps most importantly of all the high resolution, heavily T2 weighted sequences on GE scanners, those are called Fiesta and most other manufacturers KISS, but the uh, generic term is steady state free precession that works across all scanners. The temporal bone has four main parts. The squamous part, squamous means flat, the petrous part, meaning hard, the mastoid part, which houses the lateral air cells, and the tympanic portion, which is pretty much the bones of the external auditory canal. There's also two extensions, the styloid process and the uh, zygomatic process that forms the posterior half of the zygomatic arch. Uh, I think that most of this is self-explanatory, but we'll talk a little bit about squamous and petrous. The squamosa of the temporal bone is this portion of the temporal bone that forms the lateral border of the middle cranial fossa. It usually comes into play when there are skull fractures that extend through the temporal squamosa. The petrous bone is the hardest bone in the body. It houses the otic capsule, which in turn houses the inner ear structures. But the petrous bone also extends medially as the petrous apex. To understand the petrous apex, this is a plastic skull model, and you can see that there is this triangular ridge of bone lateral to the clivus on each side. We're only talking about the medial half of this ridge as the petrous apex. Translating this onto CT, and you see a triangular bone that corresponds directly with that uh, with that triangle there. Um, the petrous apex is the medial half of this triangle as shown by the red lines. When interpreting CT of the temporal bone, I think it's important to have a systematic approach, as with all of radiology. I like to work from the outside in. I start with the external auditory canal, move to the middle ear and mastoid air cells, then do the inner ear, uh, keep going medially to the internal auditory canal, the cerebral pontine angle, and even evaluate the uh, brain stem. Those last two are best done on soft tissue kernels. Then I go back and I look at a couple of particular anatomic structures, the carotid artery, the jugular vein and jugular bulb, and the facial nerve. That's sort of my checklist when I'm running through the temporal bone. So in keeping with that systematic pattern, let's start our discussions with the external auditory canal. The external auditory canal is a thin tube connecting the outside world to the tympanic membrane. The lateral half of the external auditory canal has walls composed of cartilage, and the medial half of the external auditory canal has walls composed of bone. That transition point between bone and cartilage is called the bone cartilage junction, and it's an important anatomic reference point for the external auditory canal. The bony portion of the external auditory canal should have very smooth, well-defined walls. This will become important to us when we return to pathology of the external auditory canal, and the presence or absence of erosions are critical to the differential diagnosis of lesions in this location.
Continuing medially, the next thing we encounter is the tympanic membrane. The normal tympanic membrane is too thin to be seen radiologically. If you can clearly see the tympanic membrane, it's abnormal, it's thickened. The tympanic membrane has two parts, a pars tensa, which is actually most of the tympanic membrane, and a pars flaccida. The smaller pars flaccida is the superior anterior aspect of the tympanic membrane, and it is the part that retracts into the middle ear when there is inflammation. That pars flaccida is right near Prusak's space, and we'll come back to this concept when we talk about cholesteatoma of the middle ear. The tympanic annulus is the circular anchor around the outside of the tympanic membrane. This is what anchors the tympanic membrane to the surrounding temporal bone. The superior part of the tympanic man annulus arises from a bone called the scutum. It's a Latin word for shield, and I'll show you that radiologically. So the tympanic membrane cannot even be seen. It's too thin to be appreciated on this high-resolution CT. You kind of know where it's supposed to be because it runs from one side of the tympanic annulus to the other, but you just can't see it there. This protrusion of bone that comes to a point is the scutum, and it forms the superior aspect of the tympanic annulus. This bit of air right here is called Prusak's space, and it will be important to us when we talk about cholesteatoma. Continuing medially, let's talk about the middle ear cavity and start with the ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus is the most lateral of the ossicles. It has a head that appears round in cross section, and that is the portion of the malleus that articulates with the incus. As we continue down the malleus, there is a neck and a body, and then there is a manubrium or handle of the malleus that extends towards the tympanic membrane. The last little bit of the handle here is called the umbo, and that's actually what articulates with the tympanic membrane. The incus has a central body that articulates with the head of the malleus. There is a short process that extends in the axial plane and a long process that extends inferiorly down to articulate with the stapes. The stapes has a neck that is articulating with the incus, and then it splits into two crura, an anterior and a posterior crura. Those extend to the stapes foot plate, which sits upon the oval window and thus communicates with the inner ear. Radiologically, the most convenient reference point for the ossicles is the ice cream cone. The ice cream cone is what you see on an axial image when you look at the head of the malleus and the body of the incus and its short process extending posteriorly. This very thin, darker line is the malleo and cuteal joint between the two. Once you've identified the ice cream cone and you know where the malleus and incus are, you can go up and down on consecutive cuts and follow these two bones, follow the long process of the incus down until you see the stapes. This is just our initial reference point. The stapes itself is usually best seen in a coronal projection like this. You can see the long process of the incus coming down. There's the incutostapedial joint and the stapes extending medially towards the oval window to the inner ear. While we're on this image, it's worth pointing out the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. This is the tympanic segment because it's right adjacent to the tympanic cavity, the middle ear. Notice how close the tympanic segment of the facial nerve is to the stapes. There's only a millimeter, maybe two, separating the facial nerve from the stapes, and that's why a dehiscent facial nerve can affect the stapes. Okay, back to our discussion of the stapes. When you see it in the axial plane, sometimes it's hard to see, but when you get a good picture of the stapes in the axial plane, you're able to make out the neck, both the anterior and the posterior cruce, uh, as it sits upon the oval window. Let's talk about the middle ear more generally. The middle ear can be divided into an epitympanum, a mesotympanum, and a hypotympanum. In deciding which of these sub 
sections I'm in. I like to think of myself as an otoscope. So if you're the otoscope looking in through the external auditory canal across the tympanic membrane, the part of the middle ear that you can see, that's the mesotympanum. All of this part up here that's blocked by the scutum, that part is the epitympanum, sometimes referred to as the attic. And these little recesses down here, much smaller, that's the hypotympanum. One of the most confusing parts of the hypotympanic recess are the sinus tympani and the facial recess. Those are often confused with one another. So as we look in the axial plane, we're down low now, we're, we're, very in, we're inferior in, in the hypotympanum. You see one recess coming back medially and another recess coming back laterally, and they are separated by this triangular tower of bone. That triangular tower is the pyramidal eminence, and it separates the sinus tympani more medially and the facial recess more laterally. The facial recess, of course, just anterior to the vertical segment of the facial nerve. Let's turn our attention to the windows that separate the middle ear and the inner ear. The oval window is what the stapes sits on. So here's the stapes coming in. That's going to be our oval window right there. The oval window is what transmits the vibrations from the ossicles into the inner ear. While we're on this picture, it's worth pointing out the cochlear promontory. Now, this reminds me of one of my favorite sets of questions when I'm quizzing residents. And I take this coronal image right through the vestibule, and I ask, what's this thing extending up off the vestibule? And everyone always gets that right. That's the superior semicircular canal. And I say, what's this object coming off the side of the vestibule? And everyone gets that right. That's the lateral semicircular canal. And I say, what's this What's this object coming off the bottom of the vestibule here? And everyone says, well, that must be the posterior semicircular canal. And it's not. The posterior semicircular canal is, of course, posterior to us. We're in the coronal plane. This is the basal turn of the cochlea that communicates directly with the vestibule. And this piece of bone overlying the, the uh, basal turn of the cochlea is the cochlear promontory. We'll return to that piece of anatomy when we talk about paragangliomas. Okay, back to the windows. The round window is more posterior than the oval window. And you have to come all the way around into this round window niche in order to find your way through the round window. Why do we have a round window? Well, when you are pushing on the oval window, something's got to give because you can't compress liquid. Something's got to give in that what gives whenever you press on the oval window is the round window. So you're not actually compressing the liquid in the inner ear. You're shifting it from oval window to round window. Now let's talk about the mastoid air cells. The largest of the mastoid air cells that sits right behind the attic, right behind the epitympanum, this is the mastoid antrum. This little waist, this little doorway between the epitympanum and the mastoid antrum, that is called the attitus ad antrum. That's just Latin for doorway to the antrum. And it's an important reference point for us anatomically. The mastoid air cells pneumatize to a variable degree. Some people have very few mastoid air cells. Some people have a ton. This, in this example, you can see mastoid air cells extending all the way out to the base of the zygomatic arch. You can see it extending medially into the uh, petrous, bottom of the petrous apex, as well as extensive pneumatization out here in the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. This is a normal variation. Um, and different people will have different degrees of pneumatization. This becomes important to us when the mastoid air cells shrink in the setting of chronic inflammation and you get withdrawal of bony structures surrounding those mastoid air cells. This is a good spot to take a break. This ends part one of the lecture on temporal bone anatomy.